So I'm pressing the live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Richard Rick Honig. Rick, are you ready to be great today? I am. Rick is a Marine, author, father, entrepreneur, and change leader. He's originally from San Jose, California, and currently resides in Annapolis, Maryland. He is currently the founder of the South River Surf, Surf Shop, a custom upholstery and product development company. He also, been, he also recently began to organize a second small business geared for the IT consulting leadership and change management industry. He is now working on his second novel, a follow-up to his first, which was published in 2019, Searching for Orange Belt. In his 20-year career, Rick has, Rick has worked in military intelligence, management consulting, and managed a large majority of IT and cloud infrastructure programs for a pseudo government agency, Big Bank. His personal motto is the red pill is your choice. He is a problem solver addict with a knack for reaching back to, into his past and most solutions. He has a bachelor's in business and logistics from American Military Uni University, as well as a gra graduate certification for Georgetown and change management. Rick, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Rick, talk about your time as a Marine. That was back in like the 98 to 2003. Yeah, um, it was great. I, I was in art school in California and I was kind of not really doing it. I was, I was spent more time at this grocery store that I worked at. <laughs> and one day the manager was like, we got you. And it was because I bought a car. It was stupid. I was 18 and I bought a car and he said, you got a car loan? We got you forever, man. You're never. And I just saw myself, you know, um, I, it, I just had this weird feeling of it. You know, that's, that's as far as this story goes. Uh, so I went to the recruiting center and they were sort of skeptical. They were like, what do you mean? Do you get in trouble? I was like, no. <laughs> I just want to get out of here. <laughs> They're like, well, nobody comes in here and just wants to get out of here and passes all the tests. So, um, but we worked it out and I picked a uh, helicopter crew chief as my MOS. So, and, and, and you joined, you were in San Jose. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing uh, back then it was still like a big, good, big tech place back then too. Yeah. So IBM has a headquarters out there. It's called the Alma Den building. And one time later when I was in consulting, I was working with this guy. Um, and, he used to sit, we used to sit back to back and I was talking about where I came from. And he's like, wait a minute. You mean like at the bottom of the hill of the IBM headquarters? I'm like, yeah, like I'm like, that's where I used to ride my bike. My friend got a, a speeding ticket on that hill, uh, going down that hill on his, on his bicycle in high school. So, so, so why are the Marines versus another branch? Um, I don't know. My grandfather was in the Navy. One grandfather was in the army. The other was in the Navy. Uh, I was, I mean, it was probably a little bit of like, I wrestled and played rugby in high school and I was always really small. So it was kind of a, like, nobody expected it. The Like, why not just go for the hardest one? Um, so like a personal challenge to yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I really wanted to, I, there was things like at that time, my eyes, I had started to need glasses so i knew i couldn't be a pilot um and from there it was like what's the next best thing i don't know it was like a nobody would see this coming um and sort of challenge it was really a challenge to myself so we're we'll talking about your entrepreneurship journey in a little bit but what from the marines is happening on your entrepreneurial journey so far what lessons learned from the military marines have helped you um A lot of what, right when I started my company, right when I was leaving uh, my last sort of staff position, so to speak, I realized that there were these groundbreaking ideas for like the new agile development processes that they were rolling out across the company. And it was effectively the exact same daily schedule I had in at Marine One in the helicopter squadron for five years of my life, well, four, four and a half, three and a half with when you take out all the schooling, it was the same thing. There was a daily standup, just like we had with, with maintenance admin to figure out what projects were, what, like how, how we were going to prioritize the day. So when I, it was, it was, 
ironic to say like that, if that's the new like groundbreaking way of working, I've been doing that for 20 years. Like those types of lessons. And I think it does take, you know, some effort to make sure you can link back to them to, you know, to triangulate that. But that's, the, I mean, that's the biggest example most recently that I've seen. So um, next, move on to something you won't be able to like tell us much details about, but I thought it was very interesting looking at your LinkedIn profile. You actually spent some time with the CIA, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so after the Marine Corps, I, well, in the Marine Corps, I worked at Marine One. So I got a clearance out of the deal. Um, part of being that kid that just showed up that passes all the tests was I had no bag, no, nothing on an arrest record or anything. So I was a candidate for clearance and I had a clearance the whole time I was in the Marine Corps. And then um, I met a guy at a party who was in logistics at CIA. And it was like, uh, he was, he was telling me about it and he was like, yeah, I just, you know, buy stuff all day. Like, but he was doing it in a way that I would not recommend. He was sort of braggadocious about it. And he was, there were friends of his that were like, yeah, we've gone with him to go buy computers and stuff. And it's like, after getting on board, after knowing it was feasible and then applying and going through that process, um, then through a more in-depth clearance process, it was clear that that, what I had seen is like the, the guy that introduced me to it in the first place uh, was not the right way to learn things. So backtrack a little bit. For anyone who might not know what Marine, what Marine One is, what exactly is Marine One? It's the president's helicopter squadron. So when I got there, it was under Clinton and then Bush. Um, yeah. I had to mention it was pretty like a, a durous, like a hard process to even get, get in that, wasn't it? I would think. It was a form that they had you fill out at boot camp. Like everybody in boot camp filled out this Yankee white form. And some of the guys, like if you were a guy that got like selected, but your MOS was going to be like, uh, 0311, like an infantry guy, you got selected to be like a Marine security guard. So guys got plucked out of boot camp based on their ability to get clearances for all kinds of jobs. And at the time, there was no wars. So those were like the only interesting jobs that were going on. Uh, not only, but you know what I mean? Like 1998, there was nothing. Um, and then I was in the squadron during 9 11, which is one of the things that I wrote in my about in my book um, because it was you know it's one of those parts of my life uh, and you mentioned it um, I guess before we started that I have this weird journey of collection of of uh, experiences in my past uh, as my career um, I think a lot of them were guided by those first 10 years because I went staff at CIA. And then when I consulted, I consulted for another five years at CIA. So I saw it from two different angles. Um, and then ultimately it was about 10 years of government service. Um, but um, yeah, that's kind of, sorry, how I got here from San Jose and sort of, you know, the, the CIA stuff in a nutshell, it was a great experience to learn like, workflow and there and there wasn't because of the way it's designed you weren't bombarded with like new software new software new software things that ruin change projects right a lot of like process improvement stuff a lot of consulting projects you get bombarded with so much software you get lost in that environment that wasn't that wasn't ever a problem you were more likely that they selected one tool you were going to have to reuse it for your scenario your business process and it probably didn't fit your use case, but it was the closest thing you were gonna get for a few years to get through their clearance process. So as f for software, I'm talking about. So um, that was kind of the end of, the, like see it, the agency gave me a place to get from the Marine Corps into the civilian world, incubated, uh, directed, and sort of professional. You know what I mean? Like yes. it, it it really molded me into a professional um, down to things like there were guys that taught me how to wear suits properly 
at CIA, like mentors of mine. It, and that's maybe something that's overlooked, but it's also part of that when you're in that world, one of the benefits you get is there's only so many people in that world. So. So Rick, a lot of tech companies, you know, when you leave a tech company, you gotta sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Does the CIA have some similar to that where you leave, you had some kind of agreement or they do like, they do like a brain wipe of you or how's that work? Yeah, there's a brain wipe. That's um, there's a machine with a needle. No. Um, yeah, there's, so there's, um, there are tons of NDAs, right? So like the thing is I still have my clearance. Like I still had it. So you're maintaining the behavioral aspect of like, you're not in their building. You still have to, you still have to abide by to keep your clearance sort of relevant. It's not active right now. It hasn't been for a few years, but I guess that's sort of the NDA is like the a clearance is sort of this living thing that becomes activated off of your resume when you need it. So, so Rick, you, you and the Marines a really controlled environment, CIA, you know, maybe a little less controlled environment, still controlled. And then you went to become a song, which I have to imagine was not that controlled. How do you work the tradition of being a oh, controlled environment, like basically having more freedom, so to speak, how did that work for you? And how do you deal with that? Um, it's a great question. It is definitely easier when you do not have more freedom, like in the Marine Corps, you knew exactly what was expected of you every day. And, and up until the point where it's your job to make sure everybody knows exactly what's expected of them every day. And the control is really like, there isn't a lot of there. Ultimately there isn't a lot of back and forth about it, but that's, that's not a directive necessarily. That's not control. That's years of working in a, in a, at the time we had a, a mobile home. That was our shop, a double wide. And it was a double wide. One side was the H 53 crew and the other side was the H 46 crew. So, which are two types of helicopter. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. I'm, I, Sorry. That's fine. So, so after the song work, you, and well, let's change subject. So quick, quickly, let's talk about how, like, like you said before, we talk free talk, you have these different great jobs, but all like none of them really seem connected, right? Like you, you jump from the Marines to CIA, to technology, to writing a book. Why did you do all these, like, you know, or at least to me seem like unconnected industries? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of them, so all of them are connected in that each one is an example of change, right? Where I impacted change, what I was able to change and where in a large part, I was able to uh, begin management very early. One of the reasons that I left being staff at CIA was a great mentor of mine, Chuck, um, we talked about when I was going to get a team. I had this large program under me at 150 some odd million dollars of um, processing. But when was I going to get to manage people? And he, he was pretty clear that at that agency, it was not something that happened with less than like 15, 20 years of experience in your, under your belt. So I went into consulting partially because I wanted to run teams again but also because I like managing people and teams, but also because I realized at that point I was better at fixing the machine than I was uh, kind of operating the machine in a way. Like I had this niche, I, I wanted to grow this skill set of fixing, like how do I, how do I improve? It, it was a quote from the Marine Corps is like, leave things better than the way you got them. So I was really interested in how I made everything how I could make everything better. So the program I ran at the agency, I bumped into like what I had been trained and that back to that um, sort of con more control to less control. At the agency, it was very much like you get trained on as a staff, you get trained on what you do and that's what you do. 
there wasn't a lot of room for improving things. That's what the consultants were for. So that's how I got into consulting was it was taking that, that improving workflow with changing IT systems, which has always been that change management specialty that I've had at these different places. So in the, in the Marine Corps, I, I spent a lot of my last year writing databases to get a lot of our in doc and out doc and, and a lot of the paperwork we were doing, checking in, checking out onto an online system. That's what I spent a lot of my last year writing. Then at the agency was the same thing about like car databases that were Lotus Notes databases that were going out of, they were getting decommissioned and there was really no plan on how to rewrite them. So I was rewriting those with some of the, you know, again, you have limited tools there, but some of the desktop tools, but it was still a, ma a matter of how do I get this system up and running enough to where we can track these things. It wasn't super complicated, but it was a big workflow. Um, so sort of to answer your question on how these things are connected, I have had points in time where I've changed from like a salary career, staff career, government career into the civilian world. Um, but I think that's sort of the biggest major change that I've made. Everything else to me is about these opportunities for change. So Rick, from your experience, what do most organizations get wrong about change? Um, just think about the future. They get so they get wrapped up in like, like super cool methodologies or super hip things that they learned at a conference, you know, design thinking or a lot of like how to vision the future. And you don't want to over engineer looking at where you current currently are in your current state, but you have to understand some of the things that people, some of the major pain points you're going to have in changing a workflow or a process or a system. So like not only the people part of something changing, but all the systems connected to that. The pain points about, you know, the most complaints we get is about this system or this workflow or this step in a workflow. You have to understand those really well and why they're made and sort of why, it, why that friction exists. Because if you pay no attention to it, you're, you're likely to just make that same mistake. You're going to, you might not see what that, that decision point was and make the same choice and wind up in the same spot that you were, but you didn't really want to look at all that closely. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Rick, is there such a thing as organization like changing too much? Like you said, like some companies out there, like every time a new sexy change comes around, they, they're following right or, or doing something else. Is there such a thing as a changing too much? Yeah. I think you get change fatigue. Definitely. You can get change fatigue. Because, you know, it like you're writing your yearly goals, right? And that's however defined your company is at doing that. Some companies are really huge process for that. Others, it's sort of, you know, I think it's good for everybody personally to have those goals one way or the other, because I think having lists just in general is really good for checking off progress and keeping one foot in front of the other. So having goals is really just a really bubbled up version of your list for the year, or the whatever. Um, but when you get, when you get all those goals and all that, like where I'm going and then a new change happens, especially when it's not clear as to why, like if it's not clear to everybody as to why m lots of people will go along with change, especially if it doesn't affect their day to day. You know, there's a certain level of like, well, the company's going to pay me to deal with this. That happens in companies. But when you keep having that cycle over and over, um, organizational changes, reorgs, um, changing in like the cultural aspects of policies, like you do a reorg and then you change who can expense what, that, like everybody's burnt on that one. That was a huge problem we had couple of years ago was because people get used to working in a certain way and they just want to like, I think at the end of the, a lot of people just want to get to their job and dealing with keeping within the rules is part of change. Like what are the new rules? And it can get tiresome. Yes, exactly. 
Rick, next talk about the book you wrote a few years ago. I believe it's called uh, Searching for Ar Orion's Belt. Orion's Belt. Orion's Belt. Yeah. So that came from Almaden. When I was a kid, I used to lay in my parents' spa and look up at the stars. There was way less light pollution back then, or maybe out in California or Almaden, that's how it is. But you could see Orion's Belt like super clear. Uh, and then Science Camp, we did a big thing on Orion's Belt. So it was always like the one constellation I could see. I could always tell where I was. I left home. I'm in Southern California, San Diego, right next to the airport. Like if I could see Orion's Belt, I always knew, like it, it balanced me, right? And this book started as like a journal to myself just to explore like I really like the idea when you're reading a book and you get trapped in that daydream, right? Where like, it's just your eyes moving and your brain working and it's quiet room and whatever. But for like that daydream chapter or whatever, you get taken out of your space. I wanted to see if I could do that. And after I did like the first couple of chapters, I just thought, okay, well now I have something that I've got to, I've got to explore. I've got to, I've got to get further. Like I didn't, I hadn't said enough yet. And what I, started to realize was I was trying to paint this picture of there are lots of different scenarios through life that you can explore like what's the right answer what's the right thing to do socially personally whatever and that's a lot of what the book was meant to explore not that it has right or wrong answers but I think it's worth asking like we jump to a lot of conclusions but there are also lots of scenarios that are complicated and here are some creative writing scenarios to explore that question. So Rick, did you self-publish, go to the traditional book publisher, Amazon? How did you push the book out? Amazon. Well, we went through an editor, two, two rounds of editors, and then self, and then one of my goals when I started the company was also to publish the book. So we got, went through um, Kindle publishing, which was fantastic. So it was a process, a, the total process, was it harder, easier than I thought it was going to be? Oh, I don't know. I think it was, I think it was an example of like, it was, it was this huge energy thing while I was writing it. And maybe the first cut of editing, like you get to re-explore that or rewrite a chapter or whatever. And then you get to this point where you've stared at it for so many times that you're like, can you please, can we please <laughs> like, and it was, it became this like piece of, it, it, it started the, um, what is good enough? Like, but it, don't let good be the enemy of great or perfect. So I had this goal, let's get to it um, and accomplish that last year i think last last fall um but it's fun it's great so rick you're you're doing the follow-up book now to it now right yeah um so so what lessons learned from your first time is gonna help you make this one this process better or this this book better than the first one i don't know man that first one was like like seeing a teenager climb a tree and you're like whoa you could get hurt like i had no fear i was just in it and this time I think I'm, um, the la I mean, it was so fun the first time. If I could repeat the first time, that would be great, to be honest. If I could somehow get that energy again, um, it'd be great. But so what are your goals for these two books? Like, why did you actually write them to like improve your brand or send your message out? What's your, what's the goal for these books? Um, it's honestly, it was, it's, it, it's like a, I almost don't have a choice in a way. Like there, the first one's definitely this thing that I had to get out of me. It, like there was this driving force I had to get out of me, I had to go through it. I had to do it. I think because I did it the first time and I've had so much more life experience since I wrote the first book or since, you know, the years leading up, because a lot of it is like strings of truth that are kind of way overemphasized or mashed together total fiction but there has to be some string somewhere to start with to get you off of the blank canvas right so 
um, that's why I'm kind of waiting on probably waiting more on the second book is I want to make sure I have like, what's that theme? Cause the first one was, um, what's the right thing to do. And maybe it's continuing on with that, or maybe I have something else to say. I think it's continuing on with that, but we'll see. That's kind of what I'm exploring right now. So Rick, from, for the first book, from the time you got the idea to the time it was published for how long was the process? Six months, a year? It was a couple of years. I Two wrote years. it. I wrote it in like, I wrote it and went through the first round of edits in like six months, maybe nine months, six months, nine months, something like that. Um, but that was in 20, 2014, 2014, right. And so from there, we, I went through another round of edits and then had to rewrite portions. And it was, like I said, it, and at that point I had crossed the line. Like I had done what I had, my goal was, my goal was to get it out of me. It wasn't really to publish it. It wasn't really to be like, like part of working for not only at the agency, but before that, when I was in the ring court, we really weren't talking about our squadron all that much. Like I've always had a, what I do at work is what I do at work. And the less people know, the better writing a book, <laughs> like you kind of can't, like I could have done a ghostwriter or whatever, but it's a new world for me. And that's part of this experience as well is it's a new world for me to kind of break out of that pseudo secret world that I was in for so long that uh, I think is exciting too. But yeah, it took forever looking back on it, but there were reasons for every step and I didn't take a step unless I had the right reason. So finally publishing it was like, I want this marker. I want, I want to, you know, be in the library of Congress. That's a cool thing. So Rick, how do you go about finding an editor? You just, you just Google book editors or someone recommended to you or how does that work? First one I knew um, from California growing up. And the second one, my wife knew through uh, the marketing agency that she works for. A person who had, had plenty of editorial experience um, and had written her own books. So Rick, next talk about your, your time at Fannie Mae as a director of technology. Yeah, that was, um, again, it was, I got the, when I got, when I started there, it was, I've got this problem. We need this. We need a team. We need to create a team. We need to create something here. We've got these problems that we're in charge of solving and we don't have, we don't have a, we don't have a unit here to do it. We got to organize. So I got brought in to do this original program for software remediation uh, on the infrastructure side. And it was kind of this weird scenario where this big company had, you know, doled out a lot of money for, to invest in their upgrades to keep them, uh, you know, good on their, their audits and whatnot. And with the regulator and not a lot of that work had been done. Um, so my job was to get in there and figure that out and prove it and drive it the right direction, get everybody on the same page and, you know, get a community of application developers excited about doing software upgrades. Like it was, it was, um, it was a wonderful opportunity, but, uh, it was a lot of skin knees and elbows. So Rick, looking at your background, maybe I missed it. It doesn't sound like you really had a tech background for this job. I mean, before you start this job, like how did you go from like, seemed like your non-tech background to being a director of technology? Well, when I was consulting, I was on tech teams. Okay. And when okay. I, yeah. So it started on tech teams, like on the app team that serviced like the travel department or the app team that serviced the, the building department. So I had been on these app teams driving process change from like a user tester, sometimes like a business process SME. Like that's how I started getting into tech. And then through at Fannie, it was a start this program. And it was less about technology and more about workflow because they didn't have technology that could support us. We drove it eventually to a point where 
what was on Excel spreadsheets to track remediation for 450 applications was then auto being auto scanned out of their data center. So, but it hadn't existed before. Um, then I was given the responsibility of the ARB, which is commonly what everyone knows, the, the sort of design branch. And then a lot of the other technology programs to then subsequently include AWS in the cloud. So um, it's been a lot of app teams that I've been on to see how do we change these systems so that how we can improve the process. So Rick, do you have like a, a like a coding background? No. Okay. Not at all. So what what what's, what's some of the kind of challenges you had at Fannie Mae doing all this stuff? Okay, so like Fannie Mae is like, you know, seems like a traditional government organization, kind of stodgy. I, I have to admit there's kind of some pushback when you went there and made all these changes. I think the thing with them is kind of what I was talking about earlier with the change change exhaustion. Like you just got used to how often everything was going to change. You got used to, um, yeah, it just, it became hard to really dig your foot in and say, I'm going to drive some change to some thing because sometimes by the time you got to it, the wind is, the winds up top had changed and they were no longer interested in, you know, that burning platform that they had six weeks earlier. And so, so let me talk about this first. So during this time, was this time that you do your animated short stories on processes and for IT? Yeah, yeah. So I went to, it was one of those things that I had started learning on the outside about like how I'd always been interested in how people consume knowledge, right? How to, um, how do people get things and, and started learning about Edward Tufte, um, who's a genius and basically how, how to how people comprehend stuff and how to write so that be, like how to explain your technical points so people can understand it. Um, and that was kind of where my, my career sort of was. I was the guy that was between tech and business a lot. Um, ouch. So it, pseudo government um, it's, it's a government sponsored entity. So there's a lot, it was the first place I, I ever been to that had so much regulation. Like I had been at, um, KPMG consulting, which had become bearing point consulting bearing or yeah, bearing point filed for bankruptcy at the time I was a subcontractor to a Booz Allen contract when Deloitte bought that piece of like uh, bearing point consulting, we no longer could um, be on the, the be a subcontractor or on our contract, completely unrelated to anything in the world other than the Sarbanes Oxley, like because they were the Booz Deloitte was the Booz Allen auditor, they couldn't be subcontractors on their government contracts. Uh, so I had run into like federal regulation in ways before, but not, and I mean. There's the CIA version of that, but working with regulators at Fannie Mae kind of became my, my go, I became the guy for that in dealing with a lot of the audits, um, dealing with a lot of their risk processes. How are they assessing which, and it kind of started with which apps to upgrade. If you have the choice for one and you have two, which one do you choose and why? And, and so that's where um, working with a, a GSE was fun in that um, it was, again, it was a lot of really good opportunities for me. So Rick, I think you bring up a good point. I think there's a lot of people out there, it doesn't matter the industry, like the people like marketers, salespeople, HR, tech, and they focus on being a great like HR or tech or marketing person. And this you actually focus on being a great business people, business person, I mean. Can you talk about the points that like, like learning your business versus learning your, your skill? Learning your business versus learning your skill? Like, yeah. Like, what do you mean? Like my personal like, brand or yeah, like, like my like, company? Yeah. Like instead of being like a great tech person, you should be a great business person for your company. 
and how I define that. Like, yeah. um, I think that's kind of where, like, you have your own brand, right? So being a good business person is really about what does your sort of brand bring to the table? And for me, sorry, I kind of blew through your whiteboard animation question, but like my brand is being the guy with the right tool, right? So like at that point in time, writing those whiteboard animation videos was the right tool to get people to understand what was going on. My creative brain then, there was a video about the cloud that was not published that was like so CGI, it was so CGI that I was super proud of it, but it didn't get the message across. So we canned it. Um, your, your brand is sort of your swagger. Like, who do you, what do you bring? What did, you know, like for me, being able to tie my career steps together and how they all make sense is really because of what I'm here to, what I'm here to bring. You know what I mean? Like I'm here to bring completely wide open thoughts create and creative solutions to problems that might be complicated to some people and might be super simple to others, but you know, solving problems is fun. Rick, are you still making your animated videos? Uh, no, no, I haven't done them in a couple of years. I mean, I've done on the art. I mean, my current business with doing, I started doing, upholstery and then doing some Etsy stuff with engraving and then doing um, product development with my company. And that's really taken a lot of my artistic time. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it feels like arts and crafts in my house all the time. So Rick, back to change management. It's like a lot of companies, they do change management. They got to decide on like, you know, change for the short term success versus change the long term success. Of course there's money applied to that, right? How do you recommend companies like, figure that out. Um, why are you changing? Like I talked to someone the other day about um, <clears throat> an organization that they're developing and what's going on with them. Um, and what are you changing? Why? And what do you like be, be super transparent with yourself about that reason? You don't have to be super public about it, but at the some level of the decision making in whatever your change program is going to be, needs to understand the real reasons for something and that has to be transparent or again you'll do the wrong things like i've been a part of change programs well i was part of one that a few years ago where like people it was this sweeping like consultant group that was collecting new ideas for new projects and who could save the company money by what and that's my wheelhouse but they weren't explaining the real like we'll give you investment dollars up front to do your little project to save your money. But then we are really going to expect that process change to save us the money you say it will, if we give you this money. I wound up, I, I, I wound up not taking any of that money and doing it sort of out of my own staff because people misunderstood what the change was and started started having to really answer for millions of dollars that they were going to have to cut out of their budget, which affects people. And it caught everybody off guard. And I don't think that was the intent of why they rolled that consulting company out in the first place. You know what I mean? Like it was so um, confusing that it was ineffective, but almost distracting. And I think that's why you have to be honest with why are you doing it and keep to, and when you get into implementation and operations you have to keep through why you're doing it in the first place and if something st silly starts happening that's negatively affecting the, the outcome and you're not going to meet your markers you have to reassess and you've got to be able to change on the fly rick it's like lots of people nowadays they run away from problems or they don't deal with problems why is problem solving so fun for you uh, it's like a puzzle i don't know it's like um it's like a puzzle. It's like having the right tool for the job. Like what would, like we struggled for a good couple of years with service oriented architecture, Fanny. And when I was working with the guy, Navdeep, who was running that program, we were really one, like 
it was a lot of design meetings, a lot of process, like where can we implement these principles to drive the company's technology in this direction? And ultimately one of those things was like, people just didn't seem to understand it. But when we made the video, it got everybody like kind of on board, kind of hip to the idea and it worked. Can someone be trained or some, can someone learn to solve problems better? Um, yeah, I would have supposed, right? Like to me, it's, it's it like, like something I'm, that's come natural to people. I think it's a lot of empathy. That's what I think problem solving. A lot of problem solving is really understanding like what is really happening. You know what I mean? Like not misunderstanding why someone's uh, making a certain decision. You know what I mean? Like transparency and quality on stuff. Like it goes a long way in leadership. Um, but I think, I think if you can be empathetic to what the real problem is and who your customer is, then yeah, yeah, I think you can. I, I think it's also people understanding that they're solving problems day in and day out for themselves. It's applying that same logic to business problems and not being overwhelmed with like metrics or people asking questions or, you know, <clears throat> sometimes that means it's gonna impact how somebody does something and just getting them to understand why it is that way and hopefully get their buy-in. Rick, next, um, in your bio, it says, taking the bleed says, taking the red pill is your choice. Can you explain that? Yeah, so you know what the matrix, the red pill is like, you get to see the matrix, you get to see it for what it is. Um, when I left, the Marine Corps, I made a decision to go into like civilian world, no longer Marine, no, no longer DOD world, which has its own level of security, right? Ironically, job security, at least. And growth and, you know, all the benefits of a long-term military career. But I made that decision. Same thing when I left staff at the agency, you know, that's a government job growing up as a working class family in California, having a, a government job was like the gold standard. When I left that not like willingly to get into consulting because I thought I had a higher ceiling and I thought it gave me more opportunities to grow, um, I made that same sort of leap. And so that's to me what that statement means is like every time that I've done this, uh, I'm making that decision like willingly. I could have I could have rested on my laurels years ago, but I like making these, I like doing new things. I like doing, I like solving problems. So next, let's talk about your two companies worth, worth now. Let's first, let's talk about the South River Surf Shop. Mm -hmm. That, um, like I said, that started as um, straight up upholstery. I've just been one of those people that uh, I had spent so many years of my life dealing with problems that were theoretical and my job was getting them out of, out of everyone's kind of thoughts and putting them on paper and then figuring out how to fix them. But it's still like getting people to spit out things that are sort of theoretical in a lot of ways. Um, so I wanted to learn, I wanted something tactile, something that I could touch. And I wanted to start, you know, I, so I started with upholstery and I loved it. But there were parts of the business that I found myself kind of realizing it wasn't what I wanted to do. And largely that was, you have to, it's gotta be scaled. It can't be individual. Um, not unless you're flipping projects on your own, which is a different route that I'm not real interested in. So got more into product development and then landed on this um, product that I designed for people that are working remote, people like you and me, um, people, and it's a smart home device. So I'm right now I'm waiting, uh, with a business partner of mine to decide, should we, we definitely don't have the money to invent the technology we need. It's close, but it's not ready yet. And it's, I mean, it's a battery operated, um, battery operated light essentially. So this smart, is like smart light. 
So this but, is upholstery, but it's more like tech based. Well, no, it's a it's a product company. So okay. it started as upholstery. The tech company that I started, Ivory Creek, is really for me to. Um, it's a construct for me to stay in IT, do some consulting for things like product um, selection, um, some of the IT background that I have, and some of the work that um, we're hoping to get into locally here. That's got more of an IT angle to it. So um, that's why the second one's a construct, but both of them are really just, you know, they're vehicles for kind of deliverables, right? Deliverables for whatever you're doing. One of the cooler parts of owning these companies though, is things like this, getting to meet you through Patriot Bootcamp. And I met with a few people after we went through um, the little symposium that, uh, you know, I got to work with that wanted my change background to ask some questions and map out some things they were facing. So it gave me that opportunity as well. So you're running two companies and most people can't even handle one company. How are you prioritizing? How are you focusing being There's a CEO of two companies? I mean, it's the second one definitely we're still very, very early on, but these are just constructs for okay. work paths that I could go down. They're not like, as of right now, I'm in a, like I said, I've got a meeting. I've got to get, uh, I was, I wanted to ask you about Bunker Labs because I've got a meeting with um, somebody from Bunker Labs. I think hopefully we're trying to get that set up this month to talk through manufacturing this thing. Um, okay. So, but there's not a lot to it with the company right now. I'm kind of at a pause mode because with COVID, I haven't, there's been three phone calls since March. For the for the IT company or the Surf River company for South River for for upholstery and, and okay. that's why I started developing products. Okay, so the sort of a mutual like it'll always be around, but I think it's going to be for me to do projects, boat projects and car projects. So what what's your vision for the two companies? Right now, South River that's what it's going to be. It's going to be a vehicle for this product development, and then with. I have to, I have the second decision I have with the second company is, do I want to, do I want to continue to map out the second fictional book or do I want to do something nonfiction in more of a change management style? If I do that, I would probably use the Ivory Creek construct to help that, you know, the, the business side of the book or that. Um, but the vision right now they're, they're really early. Well, I mean, South River I've had for a few years, but the IT company is really just a construct for if and when there are phone calls for IT consulting that I get kind of frequently, um, a construct to, to be able to accurately account for it. So through your career from the Marines to now, it's like, you, you know, you've done different things, you know, you solve problems, take on different challenges, do a lot of change management. What do you see for yourself in the future doing? Pe more people. I, I think one of the things that, one of the things that I'm really excited about is that when I, the last five, six years, I've been remote. So I've been working in Annapolis while my team was in Dallas, Virginia, DC. Some people were overseas um, for stints. Um, so being able to work with people again, lead teams, um, especially now that the world is tilted to this remote style of working, I have so much experience in it and leading people through it. And, you know, kind of in this style that it, it excites me that one of the things about COVID is people realizing how much of this can be done without all the commuting, without all the smog and without all the, you know, five bucks a day for coffee. Yes. Yeah, so one thing I talk about on other podcasts is like, like what do you think the best scenarios are? Like everyone's remote right now. And let's suppose magically COVID went away tomorrow, right? There'll be some people, some come down there going to say, oh, hey, COVID's over, come back to work in the building, right? And people be like, wait, you know, we've proven we can, in, 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 you know, improve productivity at our house. But now you want us to like do this our commute again and all this stuff. Right. It's so going to be tough. I think it's going to be really tough. And especially for those people 
who succeeded this year, who got better ratings than they did last year, you know, cause we've all, now, now the industries have all gone through like a year cycle, a year end cycle of performance reviews. So now everyone knows if everyone got great performance reviews, then what? Like, remember when I wasn't doing so good when everyone was watching me work? <laughs> like, I don't know. There could be, I think that's a really fascinating time. So I'm looking forward to getting into that. Yeah. And, and one thing people have realized too, like, you know, remote work's not for everyone, right? Like, right. Not for everyone. And one thing I'll, I'll tell people too, like if someone's a bad manager, bad boss, we most not going to prove that if you're a bad manager and bad boss, you're, you're just a bad manager, bad boss. You're a bad employee, you're a bad employee, right? That it's only thing that changed anything. Yeah, it's a different style of yoga, really. Like it's a way different style. It's a different muscle group. It's a different set of behaviors. It's a different set of expectations. But, and there's also a lot of empathy that has to go into it because you have to understand that one of the biggest things that people struggle with, and I struggled with it, you know, on my kind of why I had this like, I want to do something tactile moment was that when it, when you're working remote, there isn't really as much of a like bell that sounds that says you're out of work. And in some ways that's not acceptable. In some ways you've, you've kind of given an hour in the morning to get an hour in the afternoon. And so balancing that work-life balance, I think becomes critical because no matter how great somebody is at something, if they are at their physical worst by being burnt, you're not getting, you're not getting very much out of them. And they're going to be gone. Yeah. I think studies show that people actually work more at home or remote, right? Because mm -hmm. like the computer's right there or I'll just get them here for a minute or. And there's well, no bell. There's no bell. There's no, okay, bye everyone. Turn off the coffee pot. Like door clinks. Like when I worked at CIA, it was the person that set the alarm in the room. Like there's no, none of that. Be, be out before the alarm type. And I think, so managing groups of people through that takes a certain set certain experience. And I think that's what I have. And I, that's what I, I'm looking when, uh, into getting back into something using that, whether that's, I think it's probably going to be either something, uh, with a firm or through the Ivory, Ivory Creek. That's where, that's where that construct makes sense because there isn't a whole lot like, like the South river is a product company at this point. And I'm, I'm doing meetings on that thing that I'm developing that I'm trying to keep secret that I think is just, phenomenal so rick you know there's some people out there who say like remote work is great but you miss something as far as creativity and collaboration with in, in people like the in people like you have 10 people in the room collaborating and whiteboarding so 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 forth and so forth it's a whole lot better than you know being 10 people like all across you know the united states or you need 10 that? people in that room to be honest or five of them there because like it'd be rude not to invite them but you probably only need three of them and it's probably about one bubble and clarifying what somebody means on one bubble that, that in a way, but I also think there's a lot of technology that enables a lot of people to be able to collaborate like through teaming. Um, I think technology right now is like speeding to keep up with, with the end user experience and being able to like the days of learning a new tool are gone. It's either going to be intuitive or it's not Yeah. like, like when we did this five minutes till I'm like, there's no software I have to download, right? And then bing, bang, boom, couple of buzzers, click a link and here we are. It's intuitive. I never, now my studio comes from when I was recording music. So I have all this set up, but I think that's, yeah, remote working is the thing, man. There's some, I don't know what, like, it does have a downside. You don't get to be around people. So maybe there's a mix to it where you, it depends on what you're working on really, but like, maybe you, maybe you change how your flow is. Maybe your, your creative collect ideas. How's everyone feeling? What direction do we want to go is together someday. And then everyone's individual pieces breaks apart. That's no different than most every other thing I've been a part of. Like when we were redesigning the system for um, the facilities place, when I first consulted, you had the entire app team that was on different floors, but you never saw them other than the one meeting. Mm -hmm. So everyone got together for the one architecture meeting, the, well, the requirements review, and then the architecture meeting on like the sort of pseudo design on how they thought they could do something. Then there was an engineering meeting on exactly who and what would be done for each one of those requirements. Everyone got their timelines and see you next week. So why does everyone go back to a different office instead of home for 
three weeks or whatever. And if you can, I don't, I think it's feasible. I think there's, I think there is a hybrid mix, but I think the, like the biggest thing about people not being like having this pseudo remote, I think is that X, Y there's the, the leadership principle or style of X, Y, right? Like X is always looking over your shoulder, like checking the watch to make sure you're there at whatever predetermined arbitrary time has nothing to do with chickens or the sun. They're just so-and-so like 7.30, so everyone now has to rearrange their life. That person, that style is gone. And I'm so happy. Like, you don't want to be thankful for COVID by any means, but like, if that's one thing we got out of this whole experience, I think it will give people a lot of joy. I think there are dangers to it. And depression is one of them. Not being around a lot of people is another, especially if you're a single person. Like, I've worked remote these last six years, but now my wife and my kids are here. So I have more people in my life on a daily than I did before COVID when most people, it's sort of the opposite, right? Yeah. And you got a good point when people said they want to work, work remote. It wasn't like, I want to work remote and be a babysitter and teach my kids school and do this and do this, right? It's so we're not really doing remote work. We're doing remote work and a whole lot more stuff on top of it. Right. We are cramming the work-life balance together in a completely unhealthy way but everyone's kind of holding tight together in that, but it's also retained a lot of judgment. Like the, the faux pas that would have been my little kid, you know, being in my, my office or my wife's office during a meeting two years ago is no longer like people don't look down on them anymore. And I think that's pretty cool. Cause why would it, why would people be upset about that? You know? Yeah. I know some of us, I think LinkedIn or Facebook somewhere a couple weeks ago, this guy was doing a zoom meeting and so to the left of him, his two kids, like four or six, bought like two bags of flour in a bowl and started making a cake on the living room furniture, right? He's like, do I go? Do I stay? What do I do? Like, well, oh my God, this is an important meeting right now. Like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. My kids are destroying yeah. my furniture right now with flour everywhere. Like, I, I mean, you have to be able to, and, and people like, that's the other thing is that like now that people are remote, one of the things I have to catch up to more is the video thing. People are way more comfortable being on video at all times. And um, I am one of those people that actually feels physically more comfortable wandering. So I used to have this neck brace headset and I would be on the phone all day, you know, 14, 15 hours a day. And I would wander like, like uh, the building engineer at my house, you know, and now people want more FaceTime. So I think it is with more people working remote, the world is figuring out what people like and what people don't. And I think video is a good, it's a good um, alternative. I think ultimately back to your thing about the 10 people though, sometimes you don't need 10. No, you don't. I really don't think you do. And one thing that's interesting cover first started, like people started working remote. You could tell like who was extrovert, introvert, right? The extroverts, they were like going crazy. Like, oh my goodness, I can't take this. I need to talk to someone. Andrew was like, yes, this is what I want. No people, just let me do my job, right? And you could, you, you could tell the extroverts, they were, they were suffering. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying not to make too many jokes. One of the things like after one of the little blips in my resume after the Marine Corps while I was waiting for my clearance for CIA, for about six months, I did stand-up comedy purely because I was afraid of like, I felt like I was afraid of public speaking. So I did stand up comedy. So I'm trying not to make too many <laughs> jokes like that, but, but I, I, COVID the, the people that are handling it the worst are the people that have like happy hours on zoom on a schedule. <laughs> like yeah. daily. those people are having a rough time. with it. <laughs> like, I think people, people in general are cool. You it's way more acceptable to just FaceTime somebody and, you know, like, hey, what's up? My dad started FaceTiming too, which is cool. He's out in California. Yeah, a lot of one, one, you know, like I said, you know, COVID is not good, but one good thing is like, I think a whole lot more people got, you know, in, into tech, like learning Zoom, learning FaceTime, learning how to communicate, you know. Right, right. It takes a lot of, in times like this, it takes a lot of the extra stuff off the table and you have to sort of prioritize, right? And path least resistance and all that it's really a matter of adaptation and i think it's been pretty cool this one aspect of it at least yes so rick can you share your social media for yourself so people can reach out to you 
uh everything's rick honig i think twitter is rick honig south river has uh a twitter south river surf shop at twitter um uh, but i don't this honestly i'm breaking out of my shell this is my first sort of socially i mean i have the youtube channel that has um the whiteboard animation videos but that's very small so uh youtube.com slash rick honig i think that is but um that's it kind of a little it, profile out there and when, you, when is your next book going to be out ah dude i don't know first one took four years i'm still i've got a storyline and a but i don't i feel conflicted about my whole reason for writing and i feel like i'm so is this one like like, is this one a sequel to your first book or something something completely different i think it's got to be a sequel right like why not re what's more efficient than reusing the characters you already built yeah i get to find a bunch of new characters but if it's just like it's not a character study Right. If it were just a character study, then you could just take one character and spend the whole, well, maybe that's, I don't know, man. See, that's what it's like writing a book. I could do a character study second book of kind of like, uh, like the second season of The Wire that stunk that season, the one in Baltimore, terrible season, uh, or the Baltimore Harbor. God. So you're trying, I'm trying not to do a second season of The Wire. That's what I'm trying not to do. That's a good, pretty good goal. Thanks, man. So the listeners will have the links to the to the show notes and his, his social media and the show notes are at www.cabinetshaysawblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and be sure to subscribe to the Jason Cabinet's experience. So Rick, we're coming to the end of a talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Well, just be transparent, man. Most of the things work out. Keep delivering. That's great advice, Rick. Be transparent, always works. Rick, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Have a good day. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. And remember to be great every day. Okay, so we're... Stop live stream.